Hey there folks, welcome to the edition of Stranger in a Southern Land. I, of course, am your host, Jake Manning. Today on the program, I speak with Steve Carino, the king of old school Steve Carino. And I can't tell you guys how excited I am for this conversation. It's been, well, almost probably two years in the making since I started this podcast. Steve was on the list of people who I wanted to sit down and talk to. And just, it never came up. It never quite happened. And I knew I'd have to make this conversation very special for multiple reasons. Mostly because I feel like, you know, me and Steve are cosmically linked together because we are each other's true one hour Broadway. We did a one hour long match that ended in a tie, no, you know, time limit draw, and it was in front of 14 people. Not a lot of people know that about each other, but it was a legit one hour. We wanted to do it and we did it, and we did it for those 14 people. So we talk about that, but we've always been cosmically linked together, but also too, like, Steve is somebody who I've always aspired to be like as an artist, especially when it comes to the art of professional wrestling. Now, as most people know, me and Steve are not high-flying artists. You know, we're not uh, big, uh, you know, as far as guys that are going to do a lot of high spots or, or big bumps and stuff like that. But when it comes to storytelling, that's where our focus is. That's where our strengths are. And I've always looked towards Steve to be an inspiration and somebody that I've looked to for advice and what should I be doing, what should I not be doing. And I've had conversations with him and I've learned so much from him just, you know, in passing and conversations and stuff like that. And, you know, it's just nice that we were able to sit down for an hour because in a locker room setting, like usually I'm running the show or he's running the show and we never have that time to sit down and talk for more than five minutes. So for us to sit down for almost an hour and really just get down down and dirty in a sense and just start talking about all kinds of stuff about storytelling about like progressive storytelling here in 2016 when it comes to professional wrestling and taking stereotypes and turning them on their heads and taking things and turning them around and booking things and sometimes how accidents can become like positives and how we can just turn those things around it's just a wonderful conversation with steve and really kind of get in there about stuff. And I don't think there's any kind of like repeats of stuff like that because Steve's done a lot of podcasts, a lot of internet radio shows, but this is a completely different conversation. And I feel like I came at it from a different angle because of me being a performer and somebody that knows him as well as I do. But also too, I know him quite well, but I knew nothing about his time being a stand-up comic. You know, Steve is has gone down the path that I'm going down right now and that he, you know, for a short period of time, he's going to open mics. He was writing material and, you know, the things he had to do and the lengths to kind of keep it a little bit secret because he didn't want people to know he was doing it. But like, it's a, a kind of a, a chapter in his life that nobody's really discussed. And we really kind of talk about the similarities between stand-up co comedians and professional wrestlers, especially on the independent level, how similar it is and understanding those things and how sometimes the traits that we have as pro wrestlers can transfer over to stand-up comedy and how some of those things don't and some of those things do and where, the, where does that meet and where do we all come together and stuff like that. So I think that's a very fascinating conversation, whether you're a professional wrestling fan or a stand-up comedy fan. So can't thank Steve enough for sitting down and taking the time to talk to me because he had to fly out later on that day and so I'm glad that we were able to get this in we were able to make this happen so I can't thank him enough for sitting down and talking to me so he stuck with me for another hour out of his life so anyways I can't thank the people at Shining Wizards Network enough for all the hard work that they do for me and all the support they give me so make sure you support them at shiningwizardsnetwork.com also too Big thank you to my producer, Don, and all the hard work that he does for this podcast. If it wasn't for him, a lot of, well, this thing wouldn't be on all the platforms it's on, and I can't thank him enough. And guess what? All the hard work that he does for me, he could be doing for you. If you want to start your own podcast, if you're like, hey, I like what you do, Jake, and I want to do my own thing, well, guess what? You should get a producer like Don. Not like Don, just get Don as your producer. And it's very easy to do. He's a fantastic guy, fantastic producer. I can always get him on the horn, get him on the emails immediately. He's never missed a deadline and he's just helped me tremendously and he can do the same for you. So for more information about what he could do for you, make sure you log on to dsct.tv and make Don your next producer for your next project. Now, speaking of projects, especially wrestling projects, I've got a couple of them coming up this weekend. Most notably, I'll be wrestling for big time wrestling this Friday, November 25th, and Saturday, 
November 26th. I will be on Johnson City on the 25th. That'll be this Friday. And then I will be in the Lincolnton, Shelby, Gastonia area on the 26th. I believe it's Burns Middle School, if I'm not mistaken. But for more information about those shows, make sure you log on to btwpro.com. This Sunday, I will be with Queens of Combat. That is Sunday, November 27th in Winston-Salem, which is just the day after Wrestlecade, and it's happening in the same exact place where Wrestlecade is happening at the Benton Convention Center in Winston-Salem. And of course, the stars of Queens of Combat will be there at Wrestlecade the day before. So for more information about that, make sure you log on to combatqueens.com. Then, as always, make sure you log on to EveningMuse.com because Tuesday, December the 6th, the all-organic open mic returns to the Evening Muse, and the feature performer that night is Todd Riley. Very excited about that one. And then also, I must let you know, I will be emceeing for the Comedy Zone December 13th through the 17th. I'm there for like five days, guys, so... If you've wanted to see me at the Comedy Zone, if you're looking for a good time or see me perform at like an A-list club, I will be at the Comedy Zone emceeing December the 13th through the 17th. For more information about those shows and who the headliners are, make sure you log on to cltcomedyzone.com. I think I missed a couple of dates, though. There's a couple other things that are popping up. I think there's a monstrous comedy date, and there's a couple other stuff at the station. I think there's another show that I'm emceeing and stuff like that. But for more information about those shows, make sure you log on to my social media or follow me on Twitter at Manscout Manning or on Instagram at Manscout Manning. Or you can, if you've got a question about this podcast or if you want to become a sponsor of this podcast, make sure you email me at jake at sslshow.com. Or if you want to book me for an upcoming wrestling event, make sure you email me at mascotmanning at yahoo.com. Now, without further ado, because there's been a lot of further ado for two years now to get this conversation down, and I'm so happy we got it in, and we're going to get to it right now. This is the king of old school, Steve Carino, here on Stranger in a Southern Land. We're gonna have to Teddy Hart this, <laughs> uh, but are you ready to do an hour? You want to do an hour? Well, well we that did. Sounds great. We did. We did an hour, la- you know, like not too long ago. Yeah, that's that's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> we, I figure even if we said it was a half hour, it'd probably end up an hour. Yeah, exactly. It, yeah, that's it goes so fast. Yeah. yeah, hours great. Yeah, well, I, I like said like you know because last time we did an hour, like you know nobody else saw that, so yeah. hopefully people see this hour that we saw that we did. Yeah. And so yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Which did I tell you that uh, I actually uh, saw the footage of that? No, no, because I did but the six disc set of me. Yeah. And is it on there? Yeah. I oh, put it wow. on there. But the, I figured out the reason why I never released it is because there was a, the hard camera ran out of tape, <laughs> like towards the end. Uh, and then like they had to do a tape switch right in the middle. So like there's 30 seconds of it <laughs> missing. So like I, I'd always feel like if I put it out and it was like 59, 30, he'd be like, somebody oh, would bitch about somebody it. Somebody would bitch about it. You guys didn't do a full hour. I did a uh, 56 minute one hour Broadway with Doug Williams in England. Uh-huh. And uh, I, I just ran out of gas at the end. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I still, somebody brings up like, Hey, I got that match with you and Doug Williams. You know, you only went 56 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Shit. I know. That's and like, like, we went a true hour. Yeah. Yeah. Like in we front made, of 40 uh, people. Like we went one, like one minute and 15 seconds for every person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I had like, you know, we gave them. Yeah. Like, I remember was adding it up exactly how many minutes yeah. we gave each person. Cause it was not, it was like a five match show. Yeah. And, and it was just like, well, why not? Why don't yeah. we just do this? Like, All right. That yeah. was fun though. Yeah. Uh, Thomas still talks about it. Remember when you and Jake went one hour? Mm-hmm. He was there the whole time, and we needed yeah. him because we ran out of like yeah. creative stuff to do. <laughs> like, That's a lot of shit to remember. I, I remember. I'm, I remember I was out of stuff at like 32. I'll never forget the first words you said to me were like, an hour is a long time. <laughs> 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 it, it is. Oh. And it definitely was that because we like, we just ran. Like, I remember it's like we kept going back to the leg and yep. just back to like, and like, all right, let's go back outside again <laughs> and kill some more time. I was saying it last night. Like I had on the format, me and Colby to go 20. Then like the opening segment ran six minutes i go how about 15 at six and a half the referee goes six and a half i go yeah we're going home and he's like are you kidding me like we ended up with 12 and i'm thinking i'm out of shit already like so 
let's do this. Yeah, an hour is long. I don't think I could do an hour ever again. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I like I said, I don't know if I, I could either. No. But, you know what I'm saying? And, and like, I just, I don't know. Like, that, that, that's what I think of too, because that was like a time I, I did almost an hour with the Mac Brothers yep. in a tag match. Right. You know, about that same time. That's when I was trying to prove that. But then I was like, what point am I trying to prove yeah. here? <laughs> like, right. And it's not like the Mac Brothers are going to appreciate it later. <laughs> <laughs> you said that I didn't. Uh, <laughs> it was a little disconcerting. was like, hey, work my arm over a little bit. And they're like, Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> this is a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. oh. <laughs> I think we did like 58 minutes or 56 minutes. That is a long time. Oh god, it was so long. I did 55 once with Dreamer, uh-huh. but that probably included 23 on the mic in between. Uh-huh. Like we would stop, grab the mic, say something dumb, and then continue. And maybe the first, if there's, so now we're down to like. 32 minutes of wrestling action, probably 17 of that is comedy, Mm -hmm. you know, like, so maybe we did 15 minutes of work and it was like a six minute walk around the building, you know, like at the end of the day, you were like, that felt great. But then you realize like, yeah, we really didn't do anything. It was all smoke and mirrors. Yeah. But see, the thing is that I, and I, and I always bring up your and dreamers stuff as an example, especially when I put together, when I put together matches on a card or when I talk about what people like, Hey, what we should, what, what lineup we should do. I always bring the example of what you and dreamer did. Mm -hmm. I felt like it was like a masterclass and like how you come out of intermission. Yes. Yes. You would, you know why we did that out of intermission, right? Oh, please explain to me. I have Uh, theories, but tell me the real reason. Yeah. It started because, um, we never had a house show ring announcer so if you go back on those shows and you don't see a ring announcer it's me in the back ring announcing oh, okay and then we would start the match through you know and i would already be on the mic mm-hmm. uh so that's how and then it started with a 22 minute match in trenton then i became like dreamers house show opponent mm-hmm. um because he was hurt yeah so then we would just make it 30 and then i guess like bubba said something to him one day like damn are you guys gonna just go 40 tonight like we're after you and you're, you're doing all the, this funny shit. And uh, so we would start being the main event mm-hmm. because Bubba didn't want to go after us. Not because we were so good. It was just, oh, I got to sit through the shit. So then it, Dreamer would be like, let's see if we can do 50. Let's see if we can do 55. And I, um, I think we did like 45 once in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, the newspaper ripped us. Like, how <laughs> the t- newspaper? You know, yeah, they're like, doing wrestling reviews. <laughs> yeah, and I remember being so mad. Like th- those days, I was so mad when I came back. I'm like, you don't know shit, right? <laughs> like, I wouldn't care now. Yeah, and um, yeah. So like, we would just try and top it every night because uh, like it just being dreamer, being dreamer. I I was just along for the ride, and you know how much new stuff that I could throw in. But like, it just started with a a promo to this and that and. Yeah, it, I think the best one we did though is uh, Buffalo. I think we did maybe forty minutes, but the crowd was so into it from like minute one that uh, that was the favorite one I, we did. And I think it was on one of the um, our video uh, best ofs or something like that. But that that was always my favorite one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because and I always I always talk about it too is that it's coming out of intermission is a tough thing Mm -hmm. and and trying to figure out what your crowds and what crowds are going to do is a very tough thing because you, you know that there's a little bit of, they always refer to as the popcorn match. Some people will throw out a match. that doesn't really matter. I always feel like if, if I'm at, even if I book, if I booked like the first match after intermission, I realize okay, I, there's gotta be a little bit of time where we need to take our time and get these people reset back into watching wrestling because their mind has been taken out or brought back in. Oh, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? And I just like the way that it rolled from, from intermission you being in the ring cutting your promo while dreamer is still signing autographs and then calling him over so almost like when he's still signing autographs you're in the ring talking people are slowly making their way to the ring they realize they got to get back to the ring eventually but you know they're taking their sweet time like they mostly do so when tommy gets up and starts walking to the ring it lets everybody know that that's like lollygagging yeah we have to walk to the ring so it's almost like a visual cue to let everybody know go to the ring oh, because yeah. it, it's been back and forth for you guys. And then all of a sudden, Oh, dreamers going to the ring. We all have to pay attention to the ring now. Yeah, yep. And it seems to roll very smoothly. And it was usually, I would uh, like crap on Francine, which would be the, Oh, I got to go defend Francine. Yes. That, that would be the final straw. And Oh yeah, it was so, so much fun, but you, you're so right about the popcorn match. Like last night we had, um, um, Zane's kids, the power against 
to my students and I like how you it, properly pronounced it the power. The power. <laughs> the power. I write it down and I'm excited when I write power. <laughs> and against two of my kids and like they, they didn't understand it was the one kid's first match and I had them on fourth, which was after intermission. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, they're like, well, wait, why why are we fourth? Like you and Colby are third going into intermission. I said, well, we're hoping that me and Colby are hot going into intermission. They go, and if you have no pressure, like people are just coming back from intermission. Mm -hmm. If they're sitting down, they're just getting into it. So if you make mistakes, they're not really going to notice as much as they would notice the match before intermission or the semifinal or, of course, the main event. And it's it's weird that positioning, you know, especially as like a, a booker or a producer, it's it's almost like a baseball lineup, you know. Sometimes I put the worst match second. Now everybody that's ever been booked by me is going to go back and see if like was I second. Um, <laughs> oh no, I fight to be second. Sometimes yeah, yeah. <laughs> first is you know you want something to warm up the crowd. Two is okay, they're warmed up. So if this one could be is going to be bad, let's put this here. Mm. Three, let's get them back up. Four, let's send them off to intermission. Great. Five, if it's okay, it's okay. You know, mm -hmm. and then like the good semifinal in, in main. But it, it, it's so important positioning. I don't think fans like consciously understand that but once once they sit down and think of it they're like oh, okay you know match four was uh but like if you put it at match three they would be like oh that sucked you know mm -hmm. like, it, it's just the it, it, it's such a like um a formula that you know it's the things that people don't see yeah and you got to understand sometimes i always looked at it as like temperament of like wrestlers like yep. i know he's gonna do this or i know he's gonna go long so let's put him here so if we need to right, make up the time right. or like also too like this guy's more comedy or like we need right. to do this or like you know a tag match is gonna work a little bit better too there's it's like a baseball lineup is the best analogy right it's like putting me after anthony henry because you know he's gonna go like 20 minutes over and i need that extra time to stretch <laughs> were you at the last pwx no, show <laughs> i don't know where i was but skyler I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm exposing skyler Skyler, but he won't care. He's like, what the hell? I go, what's wrong? He goes, he's like 20 minutes over. I go, and I just went back, Anthony Henry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's a good kid. I just, he just doesn't understand the concept of time yet. And I, I don't think it's, he's doing it facetiously. I think it's, it's something that it takes a while to figure out like timing in, you know, you do that on TV and you're going to get killed, you know, like, no matter how good you are, how good you look, uh, you got all the tools except for you can't tell a story in seven minutes because it's a segment, then you're in big trouble. And it, it took me a long time because in ECW, we weren't given times, you know, it's just go out and steal the show. And then Japan, it was so random and vague. It's, uh, Kurosan today, uh, 15 under. Does that mean zero to 15 or uh, Kurosan 15 over? Like, uh, maybe 30 under like, okay, am I going 30? Am I, am I going six? You know, you never knew. And when I came back to ring of honor in 09, they had HD net and they're like, okay, we need an eight minute segment. You can't go over. And I'm thinking, okay, is that including entrances exits? Oh man. And you know, WWE same way. Like it's, it's so important to keep to your times. And I, I know guys get upset when guys go over their times and I try to impress upon people because you know, you're fighting to get on TV and, you know, sometimes maybe the bookers don't tell you like, hey, if you could fit your shit in in eight minutes, we could put you on TV. But it's 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 all good. Yeah, but it's also knowing the place of it. Like, yes. you understand that, you know, maybe if your third match and you've put in your 20 over or 10 over, yeah. it, it, it tends to drag. But if you know if you're on early, like, let's condense this into like a 10 or 12. Like, even if they're like, uh, 12 to 15, you're like, well, really, maybe I should be going 10 at this spot right here. Yeah. And we're going to maximize more of our potential and stuff like that. And it, it, it happens, you know, Ring of Honor at, at the pay-per-views are, are so much more uh, strict because, you know, it's a pay-per-view company and you have two hours and 55 minutes. So mm -hmm. everybody has to stick to their time. So uh, Best in the World in Charlotte, Somebody went over, and I can't remember who, somebody went over like 12 minutes, mm. and it ruined the main event. So now you, you build up this Jay Lethal, Jay Briscoe uh, main event, for, you know, rematch in the making, blah, a year in the making, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. And instead of 25 minutes, they have 13, you right. know, like, so they got to tell a story in 13 minutes. And, uh, you know, I, I always put, for, for my formats, I like to have like an ending time. You know, I used to put it on the posters, but then you'd have to break curfew every once mm -hmm. in a while to where the last match I always would put TV time remaining. Mm -hmm. So you're hoping that they have a 15, 20 minute segment. You don't like cats? 
No, it's okay. I'm right. just, it's not I, Teddy Hart's cat. Like, well, he does do my girlfriend is allergic to cats, uh, and, I, and I don't want to get too much cat dander on me. So You can take like, a shower before you go home. I wash my hands. I'll be fine. Now, i got to ask you, what was your theory of why we came out of intermission? With uh, Just that theory right there of the, the, the conscious of, like, it's a tough sell to get people away from the concession stand and everything else. And that juxtaposition. Uh, so you it. thought it was good booking. Yeah. <laughs> no, I wish it was. <laughs> I should have, I should have known what right. I was talking about. Like when I said, when you were in ECW, I should have been like, Oh, it was yeah. a money constraint. It no. was, it was a time. There was a problem. There was a something. We didn't want to give 50 to a, a local ring announcer. <laughs> okay. That's what, that's hey, what I think. Steve can do a, a, an okay. Howard Finkel. Let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> But no, that was always my thought process with that, you know, and that's why, like, when I suggest people, it's like, you should start with a promo right out of intermission. Yeah. So if, you know, and tell the guy just to go, you know, just keep talking. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And then when, you know, tell him to go as long as you want, but have like an end point, we'll cue the next guy to come out and wrestle him. But just let him just talk and get heat. Yeah. Not everybody's back yet, but him just talking in the ring, like, okay, somebody's in the ring right now. I'll slowly work my way over. And, and I think it's an experience thing, too. You, you see how many people are at the tables. Uh, you see how many people are at the concession stand and that you can kind of gauge how long you have okay mm-hmm. you know these guys are going for their barbecue it's going to take uh 18 seconds per mm-hmm. order and then okay there's a line for ivan Koloff and tommy dreamer and okay they're both going to talk to fans a little okay maybe, maybe i got three minutes to to get these people back so mm-hmm. you know how to take your time and 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 that stuff like you don't le- learn at wrestling school you kind of I, I believe you almost have to learn that on the road mm-hmm. yeah and it's it's like now that i do comedy talking on a microphone and reading the crowd like that's an important skill to have like right now and and reading okay this guy's paying attention this guy's not paying attention we have to like engage that way now uh when i dabbed in comedy uh, a couple of years ago i like i was always fascinated well how that, did you how did you dabble like what were like well, when you say dabble what'd you do okay so it it, it started out as a, a joke you know mm-hmm. um mick foley was doing arizona state uh, like university mm-hmm. uh, with it, with his first things and Cabana was his um, was his opening act, mm-hmm. but it was like WrestleMania weekend for yes. Phoenix. So what was that six years ago? Right, two thousand ten. Okay, two is ten or not? Oh nine. No, uh, I think it was oh nine. Nope, nope. It was it was ten, and I only know that because of the girl I was with at the time. Okay, uh, I, I will defer to your dating history as as a, a proper timeline on this because <laughs> yeah. I was in the middle of a time that got very blurry because of my dating timeline. <laughs> yeah. So I just like... only know the situation, <laughs> and it's a bad situation. That it wasn't a bad situation I was in because she's a great girl, mm-hmm. and um, it was just where when the phone call happened, like what the scenario was was like. I, it was one of those things like, oh, where where were you the first time you got called to do a comedy show? Probably somewhere I shouldn't have been, you know, mm-hmm. like, um, so I, um, who was it? Joe Schmo. Do you remember him? I've heard the name. Yeah. He, he had passed away a, uh, maybe like a year and a half ago. He was a California guy. He, he was blind and he worked for Vince for a little bit as a writer mm-hmm. and he ran some shows in California with like Dave Marquez and stuff. And he was behind the scenes, uh, UPW, you know, he calls me and says, Hey man, have you ever thought about doing comedy? And I said, no way. No, like I'm not funny. And he says, no, 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 it's going to be great. I have this idea and it's, it's Mick is the headliner. Cabana is the semi. And then it's you, Austin Aries and Prince Nana with Adam Pierce hosting. And he, he goes, it, it's going to be great. And I go, Oh my goodness. And he goes, and he said the same thing. He goes, face it you're going to be way better than nana <laughs> so he goes which I, in an open mic situation with like when you first start like the, the whole goal is not to be the worst guy yes so absolutely. like it's so that that's sometimes i think that thought has kept a lot of good comedians in the game like well i'm not the worst yeah. you know like and then i thought okay so I, i'm in and i go okay i have two weeks to prepare and but i'm like are these guys is austin aries going to take it serious so i see austin the next week and i say Hey man, how about this comedy thing? Like, we'll go up and tell some jokes. He's like, dude, I've been writing nonstop. I said, what? He's like, I went out and bought a comedy book and like what to do and how to write. I said, oh. so I literally like started writing and researching and um, I, I went out there and I said, okay, I don't want to be the wrestling comic. I want to tell like original jokes, nothing about wrestling. Um, you know, I painted myself as a like a. Um, is it like an awful human being? I told like a like a semi true story of um, um, 
you know, something on the road, but I didn't make it wrestling like, and it was okay. It, was, it wasn't bad. And um, so then I was like, I like this. I, I want to start going to open mics and I want to start trying this because, I mean, the girl I was dating, she al- already was trying to do comedy. So oh, like okay. I would follow her to places and I, I would do some open mics and then I would, every once in a while, I would get like a, a paid gig at like, hey, you're Steve Carino, the wrestler. We will give you $40 to do a set here at a bar. And man, I don't know why I, I went back to like 1994 when you're like used to zero and $20 paydays and someone gives yep. you 40 bucks and you're like, oh my God, I have a thousand dollars in my hand, right? And like, yeah. And I was wrestling the next day for this, like the, the, the building or something like that, mm-hmm. making way more than $40. But like that $40 was like a thousand to me. And I would, you know, I would just try st- st- stuff out. But like, I would notice that like stuff in Buffalo wouldn't work in New Jersey and New J- stuff in New Jersey didn't work in San Diego of all places. And I was like, oh my goodness, I, you know, and I would literally write every day, like, oh, what, you know, the book says write every day. And it, it was, it was fun. Like, I, I really wish that I had lived in an area. I was suburban Philadelphia at the time, North Carolina. There was nothing on my side of the, the no, state. No, yeah, your state's really dry. Tough. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's so dry. And I, I mean, I really wish that I would have, you know, I would have been a little bit younger or lived very close to the city of Philadelphia and hit those comedy clubs. Like, you know, I, I read about, and I, I see you on Twitter and bouncing here and there. And um, I would read about like Steve Martin and Jerry Seinfeld and, and these guys that would do four nightclubs a night across town and, and try out different sets. And they would talk about how, you know, somebody on 40 sec, uh, a crowd on 42nd street was different than a crowd on ninth. I'm like, wow, this is just like wrestling. You know, what works in Louisville, Kentucky may not work in Tampa, Florida. And, you know, that's something I, I try to press on people. Have you noticed that, you know, with your, with your comedy, you know, gauging the crowd, you know, do you, when you do your joke, do you have like a left and a right where it's like, you see where the crowd's going to you. Okay. I'll go towards this as the punchline, as opposed to taking it, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's very like, I want to see if it works here. Like I'm, I'm still very new that I'm not to the point that I have the rights and the lefts yet. To, you know, like, but I do see, like, you know, I know a tag is going to work or not work. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's usually like, should I go dark or should I not? Because sometimes it's the reason why I feel like it doesn't work. Like I said, it, if it doesn't work on 9th Street, but it works on like 32nd Street, is the energy in the room at the time. Absolutely. Yeah. And you have to be able to read that immediately. I'm like, okay, are they going to get this tag that's a little bit darker or do I also need to turn, turn it down? Do I need to be a little bit cleaner or do I need to get it a little bit rougher? Can Do I need to put an expletive in here? You know, can I say the F word to put it in there yeah. Yeah, to, 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 to bring this home? You know, and, and that that's kind of where I'm at. I'm still very stumbling around in the dark, but that's kind of what I've noticing too is it's it's more or less how I finish it. Like the joke is is still good. Like yeah. like like a wrestling spot. Like yep. I know the high spot's gonna work as well, but what I do after the high spot Absolutely. Is, 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 it, is the thing. And it, it's crazy how the, the, the comparison of the two uh, a thing that I noticed and it was so weird as doing comedy in a like an open mic or like a little bar area. And being Steve Carino, the wrestler, other comedians would give me like the, hey, brother, good set, like, n- but no advice. Mm-hmm. So for a while, and n- n- barely anybody knows this, like I would do it under a different name. Mm-hmm. Like I was just, you know, uh, the comic, like, but I had like, a, like a, I had like a gimmick name because like Steve Carino is my real name. I would have like a gimmick name and I even had pictures and stuff like that made so that like. This is like this was my comedy. So it's a completely different thing. And so that's the thing I, I I feel very lucky about myself is luckily I'm not as well known. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I'm in this nice sweet spot that like if you look me up, you're like, oh, this guy's gonna complete douchebag right. as a wrestler. Like he's kind of reputable and he's done a few things, but I'm not Dolph Ziggler, right. you know, yeah, like, exactly. like, like, like I've seen him get up on like uh, at the laugh factor or even like in Cabana in a sense, if, if Cabana goes out and does it, like there's going to be enough people that see him. And then there's that expectation of like, Oh, I like him so much. And he's so good at this thing. I expect him to be just as good at this new thing. Absolutely. And it takes a long time to get to that point because they've spent a decade being good at this one thing and they're only coming in the first year or two. So they're not going to be as good. Now, have you noticed the, uh, the, the, the backstage politics yet? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, it, that's crazy that you know you have the the one comic that wants to help everybody, and he's usually the funniest guy in the house. Yes, and then you have the guy that's not so funny, but is just 
seething if you're killing it out there like mm-hmm. oh look at this guy like i was like wow this is crazy um or you you have the guy that says you had a good set hey brother if you ever need you know you mm-hmm. ever need me to do some comedy i'm like i'm not running a comedy show like he wants to tag along with you so um, yeah but that's another thing too i was talking with uh, uh jacob uh Hammer my yes. last night about it. And I said, the funny thing about it is, you know, as a wrestler, you come into a wrestling locker room and it's just guys and it's just wrestlers and it's it's kind of whatever. But if like you're in like a green room area around an open mic, you know, there's probably of a, like if there's 20 guys, five or six of them have their own shows where you can do time. Yes. So like, you know, like we're in wrestling, it's very like wrestler promoter. There's a few wrestlers that are involved that can get you booked here, but that percentage is much lower in wrestling. Yes. Where in comedy, it's much higher. So you could do an open mic and do really well and just kind of like, hey, be buddy, buddy with somebody. And yeah, just you talk can about, network. Yeah. And then all of a sudden like, oh crap, you run a show that runs every Wednesday that, that's a little paid gig that I can do the next time I'm through here. Yeah. And that's usually what ends up happening. It, it's, it's wild. It, it's such a... a there's there's so many comparisons to pro wrestling, but then it's its own beast, and you, and you realize like, man, there's a formula to this too. You know, it's uh, how many laughs per minute can, you can get. Like, mm-hmm. I never understood that until I started reading about it. And, and you know, I tell my wrestling students all the time, like, man, you live in a world where all this information is at your fingertips. You can learn about everything. Like, why don't you take that? You know, like. If you're going to do something, why wouldn't you just throw, you know, dive right in and get as much information as possible? You know, I I would buy, I I still got them like comedy books that like I would jot down notes and, you know, I'd be on the plane and I, I, you know, I would have an idea for a joke and I'd write it on a pad of paper and put it away and I might go back to it. And you'd have to put it away because you, if somebody ever read it, you'd look at the most worst human being in in the entire planet. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because you're noticing these things and it's like, this was really fucked up. Like, what was that about? And then all of a sudden like, oh, if somebody finds this one line because as you're writing it in shorthand as fast as you can yeah. you know like there's there's a notepad on my phone if anybody ever found it I, I, there's no way that I could run for president even in this climate I had I had like when I first started doing it was 2010 and the Olympics were what 12 right yes and uh, yeah I had a racist like my dad's a racist joke but I'm like it, it has an Olympic twist to it so i'm like all right well i gotta put that away until the next olympics or how do i twist it and yeah i had that problem with like football season like trying to tell a football joke in july is a little bit tougher than it is in november and you, and i think you got to find the right people to bounce stuff off of like my wife's not that person you know oh. i bounce jokes off of her and she goes oh, that's just mean or i don't get it i'm like oh or like it'll say something and she'll be like did that really happen i'm like no it didn't happen it's just something i thought of uh where it's like my buddy Rob Dimension, like I will just crap on him daily and throw some jokes out there. I'm like, oh man, I wish I was still doing comedy. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my girlfriend is not the great lit. If anything, my girlfriend is a great litmus test. If she doesn't like it and tells me it's racist, it's the it's, thing that gets the biggest laugh. Right, yeah, it's definitely. <laughs> in, in an all black audience, yeah. nonetheless. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're, they are the best and the worst. Absolutely. Like my best sets have been in front of like black audiences and very racial humor. And the thing is when they see a white guy, sometimes like like that's all they want to hear from you. Like my perspective on things. And I'm the willing to look a little bit dumb and, and, portray that right right you know and they're willing to laugh at me like this guy what is he thinking and i i think once you know you you portray that you're you know you're kind of dumb to it or uh, you know I- ignorant to it, it it like it kills off any like malice into it like you're, yeah, you're not it, you're not michael richards you that, know you're, that, that's a, a hard lesson that i had to learn is that the crowd has to like you yes because as a you know we've wrestled heel before we've got on the microphone and our whole objective is to say a funny line but make people hate you and people will laugh like that was such a funny line and it's, it's got the most amount of malice in it but they'll tell you it's really funny yeah but if you try and do a similar thing in comedy they just hate you yeah absolutely. because because the, the setup is already it's very much similarly you know that you know the reason why a regular funny person in the office isn't a comedian is because of the setup. Yep. In pro wrestling, everybody knows. Oh, he's a bad guy. He's saying something bad to get me angry. But I see how that's funny. Yeah. In comedy, it's like this is a real person. He's a human being. What is he like? Oh, he's the worst person ever. Screw him. I'm right. Not gonna right. Laugh at him. It works for Anthony Jeselnik, but it it won't work because for you know Steve that's Carino and is. Jake Manning. Yeah. Yeah. They already know his his deal. exactly. And like once you see his demeanor and stuff like that, you know. 
you know, he's not that big of an asshole, but he he's such a great, you know, he plays it with his face. And, you know, mm-hmm. you, you can almost tell that he wants to crack up like, hey, I'm not this guy. But and, and I think that's what makes him him so funny. Then um, I did get advice from Jeffrey Ross before. Like okay. we went to a, a club to see him and, you know, he, he signed in his pictures and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And uh, he, he's super funny, super cool. And uh, the, the, the girl says, oh, you know, my boyfriend's a, he's a pro wrestler. And he's like, oh, yeah, he's like, you, you want to wrestle me naked? You know, you, you, he's always got that one liner. And of course she goes, yeah, he does comedy, too. And like, I, I'm thinking, oh, oh why'd you do that? Why'd you do that? You, why'd you do that? <laughs> how many times have you been in bumfuck West Virginia and you're signing things and the local <laughs> bumpkin goes, my boyfriend, he a wrestler, too. And you look at him, you're like, this guy, like, oh. And you're like, man, and you want to be nice and everything, but you've heard the story mm-hmm. a million times. Well, man, you know, I've been wrestling in my backyard, and I yeah. do like, yeah, I'm no one. I just, you know, I just wanted to say hi and thank you for the, you know, mm-hmm. I wasn't there to, you know, to bother him. I would have bothered him if I was on the same show with him, but, yeah, um, yeah comedy. Oh man, I loved it. It was it was absolutely a blast, and it was a learning experience. It was so so much fun. But what was the advice that it gave you? Um, uh, know your crowd yeah yeah you he said you have to know your crowd and you have to know yourself and i said man and i use that in wrestling all the time you if you know yourself in wrestling you're gonna be good you know mm-hmm. what why is why is bray wyatt so good at his character but somebody else wouldn't have been with the same material because he knows his character he knows who he is and uh yeah why wasn't husky harris like a, a good character because maybe he wasn't husky harris but you know he understands what bray wyatt is and he can make that you know he can make you believe in that and, and, and stuff like that but yeah one of the the, the main thing was you, you got to know who you are out there mm-hmm. you know because you know when i was out there i was total jerry seinfeld the uh button shirt blazer sneakers you know what am i trying to go for okay you know i'm trying to be not the wrestler okay mm-hmm. so what does that entail and it always makes me think of wrestling like you know who's steve carino at 43 years old okay steve carino is this you know, okay now i gotta like portray that so mm-hmm. yeah that was the best advice you gotta know who you are and you gotta know your crowd yeah yeah, and that's the thing is like you're like trying to find material for everybody oh my goodness so yeah. like 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 if i know that like wrestling's biting i've got these wrestling jokes right and then if i know that relationship stuff is working it's this stuff if i know it's this type of crap and that's that's a thing like like if, if i don't really change my jokes but i know the next joke that i'm at the tell has to change sometimes yeah yep. and, and my problem is i get very regiment of like i'm just like a young wrestler right now when as a young comedian we're like this is my match and i will do exactly like this and yeah. go right there and those are those never go over as yeah. well as they should and it, you panic if you forget you know yep. one joke was supposed to be here and you, you put it there and you're <gasps> Yeah. Oh my gosh! I yeah. just ruined my callback. Yeah. <laughs> now you start racing through it. Yes. But uh, speaking of knowing yourself, you you know, and back to wrestling in a, in a sense, something that I've always looked up to you. You know, you've always been a shining example and a role model to me in this, in that you've always found your spots. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I always tell people that you know when I got into wrestling it was very tough because. But I say I always tell people now is the best time to get into wrestling. Oh, absolutely! This is for sure because there's forward progression. Yep. When I was, I feel like my best in the ring was probably about 2009, 2010, and the same hot indie guys in 2009, 2010 were the same hot indie guys in 2003. Yeah, absolutely. There was zero forward progression. Where like when you were getting, I think when you were getting to your peak and stuff like that, like you know companies were closing down absolutely you know what i'm saying but you always, wasn't my fault yeah <laughs> i'm not accusing you yeah of that. Pop, popular legend says it is <laughs> popular yeah. but but uh but no like you you found your spots yeah like you know like you, you know you came into the champion that you found your way to japan you found all these little niches on, on the indies and then you know like how did you, how did that understanding of that how, to find these little holes that nobody else could find? Like, how did you come up with that? I always believed that I needed to evolve no matter what it, it's um, like, I don't know. It's crazy because I'm not a fan of her music, but Madonna was always a inspiration. Mm-hmm. Like Madonna from 1983 is not Madonna from 1987. Madonna 1990s, not 1983. And so she just kept evolving her character. Like what's going to work for me? And I was, I was always willing to like evolve, you know, with ECW, I was, I, I walked in with, you know, like a mullet and I, a baby face, but I had a heel character that, you know, 
uh, got over, but you know, I was missing something and you know, Raven's like, you got to look like somebody different. And you know, that's why I went with the beard and the, the blonde hair. Like, Oh, if I'm going to be old school, I got to be Madonna. I got to have the blonde hair. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and, and, this is my, this is my cone bra period right now. <laughs> and, and Raven who has the, like the worst bedside manner, like he, no, yeah, you look like somebody who walks in a bar. Like, um, I, I want to beat you up, but I don't want to like pay to beat you up. Like I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And he goes, you you need to look like Michael Hayes, and like you know, Michael Hayes was such a inspiration for for Raven, and um, so that's where the blonde hair and the beard came from, like the the, the contrast, so that like if I walked outside, you would think I was different. And then um, when I went to Japan, Hashimoto thought I was a funny guy in the office. You know, mm-hmm. I would make I would. You know, I, I, we had gotten along so well that I would, you know, make jokes in the office when I was there and stuff like that. He saw me in CW as, well, look, if you guys want to be comedy wrestlers and heels, you know, and not mind, you know, doing the job for so that Tom Howard and Sylvester Turkai could look like monsters, I mean, you guys are going to be great. And, you know, me and CW uh, were serious wrestlers in, in near the end of ECW. And then we would just go be goofballs in Japan. And so I would always just find that that niche of trying to fill the spot that was needed. And ROH, they needed, uh, they wanted Steen to turn heel. But I was already in Puerto, I was just finishing up Puerto Rico. And like, I was the first name Steen thought of, but he thought I was still in Puerto Rico. So like when we did the Steen and Generico feud, he the other pitches for his mentor were Nigel and Roddy that but you know when i became available it was like hey would you like to do this but here's the deal and and steen was real steen and pierce were real upfront like you're going to be a supporting player for kevin and rammy's feud and you and cabana are the guys there that uh you know you guys are going to be the ones to take the fall or do that and man i just said cool let's do it you know i didn't mind i didn't have to be the top guy i could be the you know the the, the dessert for the top guy. And, and that's where I always, you know, I, I found my niche that promoters were like, well, you know what? I can fill this in. Like, I was never supposed to be the guy that got pushed against Taz and ECW. It was always Candido. But, like, Chris, you know, had his issues. And Paul would look around and say, well, Steve looks like he's good enough. Let's put him in there. And, um, you know, in, in Japan, like, I, I'm sure the first time Hashimoto saw me, he was just like, look at this guy. You know, and then... He realized, like, I could help put it together, finish it. So, like, I, you know, I've always just tried to be a guy that uh, never looked like one straight line. Like, it, you need me to ring announce? I just rang announce in Ring of Honor a couple weeks ago. You know, we didn't have a ring, ring announcer. So, it was cool that I did the ring announcing from the table. It looked it looked like, oh, we're getting a special treat on house show. But, you know, other guys would be like, oh, I'm not ring announcing. I was the world champion at one time. Or, you know, so I think for, for me, especially – you know, 43 years old, I know who I am and I'm never going to be a top guy again. I'm never going to be like, I'm a hit and run guy in, in ROH. I'm the, the color commentator and, you know, I help in the back and, you know, every once in a while I I'm needed for a match. And when I do have that match, it's an important thing, you know, you know, along the lines of Terry Funk without being that cool. Okay. So, you know, but like there the, the seems like there's a lot of luck involved in that. Oh, absolutely. I'm the luckiest guy ever. Absolutely. You know, just the, the twists and turns of my career in 23 years is I am literally the luckiest guy ever. You know, I would have never, and it starts with wrestling school. I lied to get into wrestling school thinking like you needed to have an impressive resume to get into wrestling school. And we were talking about Lima, uh, Lima Ohio, uh, Lima, Ohio. Is it Lima or Lima? I think it's Lima. Okay. Um, Lima, Ohio, the, you know, the home of Al Snow. And I only know that because... Um, before I went to wrestling school, he had an ad in the old Pro Wrestling Illustrated for his wrestling school in Lima, Ohio. And I found a wrestling school in Reading, Pennsylvania. And I had no idea that when the guy called me, Jimmy Dio called me and said, you know, well, why don't you come to the wrestling school on Saturday? Do you have any experience? And I don't know why I did it. I was looking at the Pro Wrestling Illustrated and said, yeah, I just got back from uh, Al Snow's gym in Lima, Ohio. I was like, why would I say that? Like, <laughs> And he's like, oh, I know Al. I'm like, shit. No, he didn't know Al, you yeah. know, luckily. And I, I went up. He was and bullshitting you too. Absolutely. I didn't realize anybody with $3,000 can go to this school. Mm-hmm. And and probably if you didn't have $3,000 and you ended up paying 
seven hundred dollars, they weren't going to come after you. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, and you always set up the ring, and you were always there for it. They were, yeah, they yeah. were going to find a spot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, like the, they weren't going to send you to a collection agency like a real company would. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it, it, it took me years until like I told Al Snow that story. Like, I had become like, you know, not buddies with them. Like, you know, we always get along and stuff like that. Before I finally said like. Hey man, I used your name for wrestling school. Like, I'm so sorry. You know, like I, I feel like I betrayed you, and uh, yeah. So I, I've been so lucky. Like, I the first time I did jobs in, on in WWE or WWF, it was because remember Bob Bob Star, Playboy Bob Star, he got sick or his car broke down or something like that, and I just happened to be on the road with Tom Brandy and was going to go with him because he did not want to drop me off on the way to. Um, state college pennsylvania so he just he was going to bring me along and i'm like oh my goodness i'm gonna get to watch raw from the you know mm -hmm. from the family seats it just happened that like they needed an extra jobber and then when i got to wrestle tom the first night in like a dark match but one of the cameras wasn't working so they let us have like eight or nine minutes and i had worked with tom so many times that like he was just calling stuff on the fly but it was offense for me and you know then the next day i did a thing with crush where uh i was the i was the the fan in the crowd the beat got beat up and uh you know so and, and at the time they were doing fake diesel and fake razor so you know i look like the, the the kids so they were like oh my goodness we could use you in this spot or this spot or go here and you know it's just so lucky just absolutely i i'm truly the luckiest person ever with, with i haven't never caught an std you know that's that's some i mean luck. i mean i don't think there's rats left anymore anyway really no oh, okay i've been married happily married for a few years now but and I also I'm not also not the guy to ask either. So. Right, like, I, I'm just saying, <laughs> like, breaking because area we're talking about. We're like I, I was gonna say I was like if you're like you know maybe I should ask Jake if there's any more rats because that's most certainly my reputation. No, we're, <laughs> right, we were just talking. Me and Frankie Kazarian were just talking. We're like, man, has the business changed? There's like, there's no bullies. Like if if you went up to Leo Rush and said, "Hey, man, have you ever done somas?" He'd be like. What are somas? Like, I just want to go back and watch my match at, at the hotel. Yeah, I just want to watch like YouTube of the guy that I'm wrestling tomorrow. Yeah, or play absolutely. Video games play or, video yeah. games and get a good night's sleep and get up and go to the gym. Yeah. Like, you know, the, the 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 locker room bully is gone. You know, um, what else? And yeah, the guy that has all the rats. Like, no. if he does have all the rats, like he's totally under the radar. Like, you don't know it. And I'm thinking maybe people know it, and I'm just the old guy that doesn't see it anymore. But I'm thinking. Maybe it's just such a different business now, you know? Oh, yeah. And even just the, the idea of like like chair shots. Like I was bringing the example of like Balls Mahoney yelling at you for putting your hands up. Yeah. Like I was probably on the very tail end of that discussion. Like, don't you dare put your hands up. Yeah. And now I, I actually I remember the match that you and Steen had and people were freaking out because you guys were doing unprotected chair shots. I'm like, when did like fans get mad yeah, that guys have not protected themselves? Like, this is insane. Yeah, absolutely. It's the complete opposite. Like fans were mad that you would put your hands up. Now they're mad that you don't. Yeah. And it, it's 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 so weird how uh, fans have changed. Like maybe it was too violent. You know, I, I had gotten that for the match with BJ Whitmer. It, it, it best in the world and like if they only knew the steps that i took to make it the illusion that it was all you know violent you know it, it was it was something that like i worked on for months like man what's going to work here that people are going to go wow that looked violent but in reality it wasn't like i literally walked through the curtain that night and i went oh, that was way too easy but then i watched it back on video and i said wow, that looks so violent and so deadly. And it wasn't. And I, I you know, so I took some of the, the negative feedback as maybe I did my job right that I made it look unsafe and violent. But it, the reality is it was, it was fine. Like yeah. I, I woke up the next day, not hurt, you know, and he woke up not hurt. And then I look at some of the, you know, the crazy stuff that some of these kids do. And I, and I, I feel for them like the, the deathmatch guys. I like, I truly like, because they're always good guys. You, mm -hmm. you would think you watch them on video and be like, man, look at these idiots. They're the nicest up. guys. They were the ever. sweetest, ever. nicest guys ever. But, and the, I wish they were jerks. Yeah. I wish they were all like Ian Rotten. Yeah. So we could all just be like, I'm glad you're destroying yeah, your I'm body. Like, oh, I wish a nail would just go through your eye. But no, they're all so sweet that you start feeling bad for them even more. Like, oh, why are you taking that light tube to your back? And, you know, there's 
there, there's children here and put your hands up and oh don't use thumbtacks they're gonna stick on you and oh my goodness wash the mat off before the next bloody match so that like you guys don't get hep c it's mm-hmm. it's uh, I don't know if it's because I'm older or it's a different world that we live in, but man, some of the stuff that I did in ECW, I, I, 99% of the stuff that I did in ECW would not float today. Yeah. You know, and I, it bothers me when people go, oh, I wish real wrestling was back. I'm thinking, you wouldn't handle it. Yeah. You guys couldn't handle it. No, this is the greatest time for wrestling. These guys are going out and creating this illusion that, you know, that they're, they're, they're doing things that are crazy stunts and stuff like that, but they're doing it at the safest part that they can as opposed to ecw and just hitting each other with un you know the hardest that you can with a chair you're like oh my goodness you know balls must have taken five years off my life with those chair shots um you know i i don't know how many concussions i got that i worked through man how many times did i you know, and I wasn't married at this time, but like how many times did I bleed and then hook up with a girl later? Like what, what danger could I have put her in? You know mm-hmm. what I mean? No, it, hey, I was, you know, I was probably safe during the act, but man, I have open cuts on my head. Like what if, what if one of the wrestlers gave me something and I gave it to that person who might've taken it back to her, somebody else. And you, you think of those things like in hindsight and you're like, Man, you don't want it to go back to what it was. You you don't want it to. And it was all very romanticized when we oh were my doing this. Yes, yeah, yeah. It was all for the business and this and this is how you do it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying this is what makes you a real wrestler. Oh, I remember New Jack and Balls just screaming at a kid for putting his hands up for a chair shot. And you know nowadays, like you would scream at the kid for not putting his hands up for a chair shot or. Oh my goodness! Are hitting each other way too hard in a, in a in a trade of elbows, and they come back and they go, "Well, that's strong style." I'm like, "Do you even know what strong style is? Tell, sit down and explain to me what you're doing, because I'm going to guarantee you that Nakajima and Shibata are not hitting each other as unsafe as you guys are, not mm-hmm. as hard as you guys are, but unsafe. And you know, it, it's got to be a safety thing. I, I believe that wrestling in 2016 and and you know, 2017 is an more of an art form than it's ever been. It's not 1991 anymore. They know, mm-hmm. you know, but now it's, we create the illusion. Now it's, we're watching a movie like Tom Hanks is my favorite actor. And for two hours uh, when I'm watching Philadelphia, I believe he's has AIDS. But when that movie's over, I don't believe that Tom Hanks has AIDS and I accept that. And, you know, uh, then I watch Forrest Gump and for two, for two hours, I believe that he's a, a simpleton that, you know, gets lucky and, and, and comes into all these different things. Uh, but after that, I don't believe that Tom Hanks is Forrest Gump. And I, and I think fans accept that now that when we're out there and we're doing our job, the suspension of disbelief is there. But in the parking lot, you're just Steve, the guy that, you know, has two kids and a wife and a house and, you know. I, you know, I'm not not signing your autograph because I'm a heel or, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to portray that, uh, you know, me and some guy that I just wrestled are uh, we can't drive in the same car anymore. You know what I mean? Because fans are smart, like they understand. And it, in this age, we're not insulting their We shouldn't be insulting their intelligence. We should be giving them the 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 show for the time that we are there and then afterwards we're just regular people again playing a part it's okay now and and we have such a cool job because we're artists and we're travel secretaries and we're stuntmen and we're we're all these different things storytellers and uh you know producers and you know i i have a big one for now going up to the the during a tv match and telling the camera guys which angle to shoot me during which spot so that it can look better, you know? So now we're television producers, you know, mm-hmm. like, hey, make sure we get this. Yeah, directors and everything else. Absolutely. Right? And it's pro wrestling has become, you know, instead of a world of tough guys, it's a world of, you know, pro wrestling is now, a, being a pro wrestler is, is a combination of all these cool jobs into one. And I wish more people would see that. And I wish more of the old time guys or old time fans that like crap on today's product would say, Man, it's just different. It's just, you know, you can't tell me that when Luthez is doing his thing in the 50s, like Stanulus Zabisco and, and Frank Gotch aren't going, 
Look at that motherfucker doing two high spots in a match. He is killing the business. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Everything evolves. Wrestling evolves. The world evolves. And if you don't, then you're gonna you're gonna be that guy that's stuck on the horse of. Well, ECW closed 16 years ago, but we couldn't get back on another horse because we weren't willing to accept that the world changes and the you know, entertainment world changes. And, you know, then you're just the bitter guy. And, and you know, that, that to me is just, you know, it, it ludicrous. It's absolutely ludicrous that you would not accept how good the present is and how cool the future is about to and, you, and you're stuck in the past. Yeah, and this was focus on the athleticism, yeah, as opposed to maybe necessarily the violence, and that's what when they see violence, they get they get weirded out. I feel like too, like like gifts are a big thing, but it's always like the big high flying thing. Where yeah, like I'm sure if gifts were around in '97, it'd be filled with unprotected chair shots, oh, and yeah. bumps on the floor, and and blood balcony, everywhere, yeah. balcony dives, and and that still does exist a little bit, and guys do move up it with still some of that violence but they don't last very long or, or an injury will happen and that's like the worst thing is those sidelines yeah things happen and also too but then that also pushes guys athletically to push the boundaries and in a different type of danger you know what i'm saying and yeah and i think today's guys with with the like the the complicated high spots and the dives are yeah. smart enough to know how to protect themselves out there they're not putting themselves in as much danger as you know i always look at nick jackson from the young bucks as this guy, if he's diving on five people, he knows exactly where he's going to land. But if two of them move, he's in midair is going to turn and make sure he catches the other three because he knows what he's doing. He's just not going, you know what, I'm just going to dive tonight and see how it goes. Mm-hmm. Whereas like my son Colby is 20 and he can do all these high spots and he hasn't gotten into that, that I know myself that if the guy's not there on a on a suicide dive, what the hell am I going to do? Oh, I'm going to eat some chairs and it's going to hurt, burst my elbow and stuff like that. And uh, you know, that's three less bumps on my bump card. Mm-hmm. Y- so, you know, where and and that's the growing part. You know, in two years he won't make that mistake, but now it's you know it's on botchamania because he landed in the third row and there is nobody in sight. You know, in it, it, you know. Oh, granted, he was going to miss anyway, but like the guy could have been closer. Okay, he's not closer. What am I going to do to compensate? And so I, I think guys are smarter with high spots now. Yeah, and and I feel like that's important because I was just having this discussion with Caleb because uh, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts and, and listening to Joe Rogan talk about like because he when he was a fight instructor to, when he was a, a judo instructor or something like that before he was a comedian and like an actor and stuff like that. And he talked about that the dumb guys were always like the best fighters right away because they'd have no fear about getting their ass kicked. They'd have no fear. They would just go after it. But then as soon as they they lost, then they th- that level of incivil- invincibility left, and then they weren't quite as good. But it was always the smart guys that weren't all that great first, and sometimes they were like, oh, this is dumb. I, I'm getting kicked in the head, or yeah. I'm getting thrown around. This is not really what I should be doing. But if a smart guy can figure out – this is my strength. This is my weaknesses. This is where my spot is. This is where, where I need to be in this situation of weakness. This is where I need to be in my position of strength that you can figure out those things and manipulate yourself into success. Right. And the smarter guys are the ones that last the longest. It's probably true in wrestling. Yeah. You know I'm, so, I mean? I'm starting it's, to see that theory. Like yeah. I see some of these young kids that are just doing dumb high spots. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. But then the guys that are like, Okay, I see. There's a little bit of thought process to yeah. it. Yeah, seem to be the ones that stick around. Yeah, I, I think the Bucks are the best at it. You know, they 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 know which high spot's going to get the biggest pop. And they know where to throw it, and they know how to protect themselves. So I, I love that. Uh, damn cat ramped through my nose like I got like a a phantom cat hair. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness! So but, it looked like I'm going after my nose the whole interview. Yeah. But yeah, I think I think that it, it's it's completely all different now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I feel like you've you're not like one of the, that's why I think you've stuck around a little long as you have is you don't be like, well, things are different and you don't know why it's different. Right. I think you have a, a clear idea of what's different. But when, how did you get to the point of like, hey, I need to be observing this like you're a very observant individual of how things change. I think what, it, I think it's something with the, the world, too. You know, it's like reading what's going on in the world. Uh, I, I was with Ivan Koloff last night and like, I don't know, some of the things that go through my mind is, and I don't know if he ever got this question before, but I said, sir, if the Berlin Wall doesn't go down in 89 and communism doesn't fall later, 
and it goes down in 84 is Nikita Nikita. And he's mm-hmm. like, what? I go, yeah, think about it. He wasn't ready in 84. And, you know, the, the, you know, the, the heat of what was going on in the world, the Cold War, you know, um, you know, Rocky Four was coming out at the right time. Like, what if communism fell in 84 and 85? Would Nikita Koloff be relevant? You know, like, whoa, what the hell? Like, you know. Uh, what if Tom Selleck wasn't the hottest guy in America, 81, 82, 83, would, would Terry Allen have had a different gimmick, you know, like, so I, I, I'm very observant in what's in the world right now. And it, it's one of the reasons that, and, and people get on me and I, I try not to answer them. So I'll answer it here, you know, with the Kevin Sullivan stuff in ring of honor, you know, why is it taking so long? And it's easy ring of honor. Everything else is fast for this to work. I need to manipulate the crowd so slowly like a lost episode. Mm -hmm. Answer one question and create two more. And I'm connecting all these (laughs) dots that if I connect the the dots to where it's going, if I connect it in two episodes or two months, it's a rush. When they all connect, it's all going to make sense. But I can't tell that to people. I can't say, this is where we're going. And when we give it to you, you're going to go, oh, now I get it. So it, it's, you know, it, it's one of those things that I, I keep watching what's in the world because, you know, w- with this this angle, I'm giving, like, it's literally been three years. And it's had so many bumps and bruises and left turns that to where I, now I have every place that I want to be. And I, there's literally three more steps that are almost impossible. And I'll tell you off the air where it's going. But like when I give it to you, you're going to be like, I didn't see it going that way. And when it happens, you're going to be like, holy shit, this is the last episode of Lost where some people loved it and some people hated it. And I'm prepared for that. But I always try and think that, you know, uh, look what's in the world. What's pop culture? Like I ask uh, guys all the time, like, why are you uh, you coming after this music when you're 21 years old? Can we stop for a second? Yeah. yeah sure. Okay, thanks. Yep. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, going back to, you know, I, I try to see what's in pop culture. I, I I ask guys all the time to like, I used to use think outside the box. Guys, everybody's got to think outside the box. I try to think outside the box. And then I read something on Facebook once that said, what if we eliminate the box? Wow, that gives a whole open, it opened my mind to so many different things that, you know, when I'm writing, thinking, okay, I don't have a box. And Kevin Sullivan likes to say, Steve, I like to paint off the easel, right? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, okay, cool. This is where, like, just in, he's such a fascinating person, not at wrestling. You know, you take wrestling out of the equation, and Kevin Sullivan's a fascinating person. What what his theories are in life and, and what, you know, you know, you ask a question, but you get, you know, you, ha- you ask a question, get an answer, but you, now you have two more questions. So I, I think that, you know, I, I've always had that ability to know that, things are going to change, you know, it, it's, and I'm willing to accept that, you know, I'm willing to accept, you know, and, and we have, and we have to, in a sense, because we're not Nick Jackson. No, I can't do the flips, but I still want to do it. So like, if I can't do the intricate flips, then we have to come up with intricate storytelling. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? That's why I thought it was so frustrating. Like where people are like, you should be a, you should do a Russian gimmick, not this bullshit, like man scout thing. I'm like, why? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Let, let's be creative. Let's be different. Let's see it in a different angle. But like us as individuals, if we want to stick around, we have to be creative in our storytelling. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's the one thing that that's untapped right now in wrestling is that, that we don't have compelling stories. Everything is still very, he's a bad guy. He did this. He stole my girl, you know, yeah. or he's going after the belt. Like, I don't think the storyline, you know, part of wrestling has been updated much like the in-ring product has. I, I, t- I totally agree with that. And I, I think it's because the writers and the bookers believe that the fans already know who this person is mm-hmm. as opposed to, because we know who he is. Oh, okay. I know who, um, you know, I'm going to use Silas Young as an example. I know Silas Young's the last real man, but the person just watching for the first or second or third time, do they understand what the last real man is? Like, yeah. you know, I, I, they were cartoonish in the eighties, but the vignettes before somebody would debut in WWF were amazing before they would even step in the ring. You knew who they were um, because they were, uh, they were a different character than when you saw them in the NWA or AWA. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, I, I think that 
we could slow down and not the in-ring product. It's slow down your angle so that you can have background on people. Do you watch The Blacklist? Uh, no, I do not. Uh, the greatest show on TV right now. Uh, and uh, James Spader, I believe, is like the greatest actor in today's world. And it's such a compelling show and you, you just want to watch more and you want to get more information and it's frustrating in the fact that you're not getting all the answers you want. And now I'm four seasons in and this guy's the number one fugitive. He's number one heel in, in the world, but he's also the number one baby face uh, like while you're watching it and you still don't know his backstory. They just tease it and tease it and tease it. And, you know, so you think you know who he is and but you're you're getting pieces, you know, uh, but you want to know who these people are uh, and you know that there's a OK, they're eventually going to tell us who this guy is. Now, with wrestling, we I, we have to start telling these people who this guy is. You know, sometimes you got to reeducate the people. What if Dolph Ziggler has been in WWE for 10 years, you know, and he's evolved a little bit. So why aren't we doing more sit downs or backstage or vignettes and saying why he's evolved to this this character? And, you know, the it's. I think we assume that the fans are so in tune with what we're doing instead of, hey, let's just educate them the way we want them to, to perceive this character. Or they feel like that it should be dumbed down. Yes. Which, and I don't believe so. Yeah. I, yeah. Like, I, 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 in certain instances, it's like ooh, when we present it, it has to be completely clear, but yeah. I don't think it has to be stupid. No. I don't think it has to be dumbed down. I feel like it needs to be clear so everybody can understand what we're saying. But I don't think it needs to be a lower brow type of message. Uh, I totally agree, and I, I that, and that's something that I, I you know we as as I, I guess because how we grew up in wrestling is is like more you know uh, well it's for the lower middle class and stuff like that. But you know what? Like you watch commercials on Raw and SmackDown, and 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 they're not for the lower middle class. They're for the middle class people. So like. Why are we dumbing down for the, the the lower middle class? And really, is the lower middle class that less intelligent? No, they're they're into this form of entertainment. Just because you like professional wrestling doesn't mean you're a dumb person. You know, mm -hmm. I, I know doctors that love professional wrestling, um, lawyers that love professional wrestling. Why, why why do we assume that everybody is dumb or mentally challenged because wrestling's fake? TV is fake. You know, like. Uh, the the best musicians don't always get signed. You know, it's it's a world of entertainment, and the entertainment industry is a lot of luck. So why why do we assume professional wrestling fans are dumb, and why do we dumb it down for them? We're, once again, we're insulting their intelligence, mm -hmm. and I think that turns people off. Like uh, they think I'm dumb. You know, I'm a big believer that not every heel likes every heel. Like you, you know, when I grew up, one of the things that I loved was the storytelling of. Ba a guy, heel turns baby face, but all the rest of the baby faces don't trust him right away. And it takes three months for them to trust him. It takes one guy like, I'm going to trust him first. And then the rest of the baby faces are cautious. And then eventually. That's he, why I like the whole WCW with Lex Luger when he just came over. Like Sting's like, no, this is my friend. This is my friend. And everybody else crapped on him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, um, exactly. And it's who made me tune in every week, you know, and who says like I tune in just to figure out the storyline with Lex Luger. I don't think a lot of people say that, but it did me. And to go back on that 20 years, you know, he was floundering in WWF. Mm -hmm. He was a mid level guy. Like, you know, he wasn't on TV every week. He was stuck in the, the tag team with Davey boy that, you know, that run in 93 was, it didn't work. So, you know, Vince losing him wasn't, you know, I am sure he didn't go, uh, Lex Luger. What are they going to, I couldn't do anything with him. What are they yeah. going to do with him? And they did like, they figured it out. Like, oh my goodness, if we played real life here, you know, it'll be there. I also believe that like all heels don't like all heels. You know, mm -hmm. we all have different mindsets. And at the end of the day, we're heels. Like we're bad people. Why would I trust another bad guy? Um, and I think people think that too. You know, they, they think like, well, how can you team with you? fight a guy to last night in a steel cage match. And then all of a sudden your best buddies on TV the next week, wouldn't there be a feeling out process of, Hey man, you did some bad stuff to me and I did bad stuff to you. Like, uh, we're not going over each other's family's house yet. You know, the, the you know, we're going to get tight over time and, and stuff like that. And yeah, we dumb it down and we'll say, well, it's wrestling. Uh, well, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, in this day and age, rules are being broken. You know, Triple H is breaking all the rules. And, you know, fans are excited about di different things. So, you know, 
stop insulting people's intelligence. Yeah, I mean, just look at the popular TV shows. If you just listen to the Blacklist, Lost, yep. I'm in big into Westworld, and I still really, really, I get more questions, but I get just as many answers the next week, but I think I get more questions every yeah. week. I don't know what's going on there. And you look at Game of Thrones, and it, like, the multiple different characters, all you really know for sure is this guy's a bad guy, but then you see one of the, the people that started off as being the most awful people ever, and now you're like, oh, I feel kind of bad for this guy. Like, he's now the biggest baby face. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And, you know, we all think that what we watch as kids and what came before us was so great but like in reality it's, it's not have you seen an a-team episode recently I was, yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> like, have, have you seen a georgia championship wrestling squash match uh, from 1982 <laughs> in a ring that's you know 12 inches off the ground and the guy doesn't know how to bump you know but the storytelling was so good and you don't know where you were in the world at that time you know like i was eight nine years old i didn't know any better life was good blah 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 you know who you know I also believe that people that write on the internet that write negative things are always going to write negative things no matter how great it's going to be. But at the end of the day, they're watching. You know, you don't know if he's a negative person in real life. Like, I'm I'm happy, you know, somebody writes something bad about me. I, at my age, knowing who I am, I don't take offense to it. I go, oh, maybe this is just, who knows what's going on in his life? Maybe he's a negative person. Maybe I'm not telling the story enough for him or he doesn't understand that where the story's going. It's not like I can reach out and tell him like, hey, this is where it's going or this is why I do what I do. And, you know, it, like the, with commentary, well, your New Japan commentary is so different than your ROH commentary. Well, because I can't do the same stuff that I do in ROH they do in New Japan and I can't do the same stuff in New Japan that I, you know, in, in ROH. So the... the but you can't explain that to people because you want them to to understand. You want them to understand that it's different characters and, you know, and, and everybody's going to be negative, but people are going to be negative. But at the end of the day, you want to go, all right, well, at least you're watching, you know, you're, you're going to crap on anything that I put on there, but at least you're watching. And sometimes you want them to be bothered at that time. Yes, absolutely. Because sometimes yeah. you have that unsettling feeling of like, just even this, like the walk of, uh, Walking Dead yeah. like season finale, like it bothered me for a couple of days after, and I and a lot of people like were mad, like, "Oh, why would you leave it on a cliffhanger like this?" But like, and a lot of people like they're messing with our emotions. I'm like, yeah. but that's good pro wrestling, absolutely. And, I, and that's like I tell emotion. I keep telling people like, no, that's what pro wrestling does, and that's what makes it so great is yeah. that like I'm like I. Why would you not tell him? Like, it, I, it'd be nice if you just told me who died so I can deal with it for an entire off season. But now I have to wonder who it possibly could be, and then they come back and like. It was way worse than I thought. Right. It's the anticipation of what you're going to find out. And, and I think that's, you know, we used to do that with wrestling. We, we get so mad as, as a kid where we got to go and you don't get the, the end of the match and you got to wait another week to see. We're now like an internet guy. Like, I can't believe they did this. They made a complete error in judgment yes. in doing this. But no, we wanted you to be bothered. Right. I can't believe they did a DQ here yeah. and, you know, the, uh, a count out such a BS finish. Of course, it's a BS finish because I want you to watch next week to yeah. see the, the story and stuff like that and sometimes you know wrestling and i don't know if you agree to this i never understood that wrestling is always looked upon as like a lowbrow form of entertainment but god forbid we do anything lowbrow mm -hmm. and we get called on it you know this is a, a, a industry that had nazis and evil Japanese people. Oh, and, I've got a whole podcast based on looking at those lowbrow things. Yeah, like, absolutely. And, you know, people weren't offended then, but if, if you put out a, a a character that, you know, I always, do, this is my joke, and, uh, and it's a joke, and people, you know, every I think we live in a world where you want to be the first person offended. Mm -hmm. You're not really offended, but you want to be the first one to say you're offended. Like, I always joke that when I pitch stuff to ROH that I'm going to pitch something bad, really. I'm going to pitch something bad first so that my next idea is going to be awesome. And my go-to idea is is two masked wrestlers with a bodysuit, and it's pink and purple, and they're called the Assassins. And everybody goes, what? I go, capital A, capital S, capital S, A-S-S-I-N-S. -S -S. They're gay assassins. No, you can't do that in today's world. Well, why? We're pro wrestling. Like, don't you want people to be outraged that like <laughs> we're, we're taking what we think is a stereotype and we're putting it on TV? Like, and you know, and I said, well, they're like, well, 
if, if you beat them, then you're gay bashing. No, you don't. You have a tag team of two big, strong dudes that, you know, I'm going to use James Drake and Zane Dawson as an example. Mm -hmm. They just happen to be gay, mm -hmm. right? Pat Patterson was a tough guy and he's gay. Like, we understand that gay people, it's a way of life. It's, they're, it's not something's wrong with them, right? Maybe Zane Dawson and James Drake are the ones that are going against the assassins because of the negative stereotype that they're trying to portray. And mm -hmm. that becomes a feud. And oh, we can never do something like that. Well, why not? Why not? Like wrestling's built off stereotypes and entertainment and, you know, uh, you know, the evil Japanese character. Like, man, I used to like it doesn't have to be ignorant, but it's, it used to be like the, the thought provoking thing of like these guys are upset that you guys are doing this portraying this negative thing yeah but you always have to have that that come around like no 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 no, no. we're coming in to defend that yes it, exactly it's it, there has to be an insult we're, but we're, there has to be an offense yeah we're showing what we what you think is the ignorance first but what we're giving you is the you know is taking the it progressive away. uh movement. yeah you know it's, it'd be like the new day fighting like guys that came in as a uh, nation of domination, like scare or like a crime time s guy. Like, Oh, is this what you think black people are? Yes, That's exactly. not the case. Yeah. And this, God this is what we, we are. say that, you yeah. know, like wh why are we so worried about offending wrestling supposed to offend so that you can, you know, good versus evil and stuff like that. So, and I that's think, progressive in a sense too, is like, cause you know, the evil Japanese character never had, you know, this Asian American, like you were giving me a bad name. This yeah. Is, you know what I'm saying? That, that was always the, I think the negative thing about wrestling when they did that is there was never the counter argument to it. It was always just white people beating up yes, the yeah. people where you, if you have, they threw salt in your eyes. Yeah, exactly. Like to, to, to me, it, it's, it's the, you have to have that, but you have to have, I think where it becomes progressive is you have the person that's like, no, this is not the stereotype and say that like, this is wrong. Yeah. And that was, I think always the problem with wrestling when it would be racist or homophobic in that sense. You didn't have somebody saying this is wrong. They're like, ah, let's just beat them up. Have a yeah. white guy beat them up. Yeah, yeah. Like that was the thing that turned people off. It, it, it sure did. And you know, I think we could, we could definitely take progression with the old stereotype storylines and create something new and entertaining. I think, be, I think it needs to be done too, because oh, there's absolutely. such a history of that and nobody's addressed that and the way things are as far as like sexism, racism, uh, homophobia, I think those things need to be addressed and fleshed out in professional wrestling because it is the the theater of arts and, you know. Have I ever pitched you Cole Cabana's uh, greatest rival? No. This is a good one. Okay. This is usually one I pitch every week, just to, especially if I got a good one behind mm -hmm. it. What are two things that people hate in the world? No. You may know this. I've had this one in my back pocket for years. And one of them's in pop culture right now. We always hate Nazis. Yes, I was going to say not Nazis. And clowns. Okay. So what if we created Hitler the clown? <laughs> right? So now, or, or just have Jerry Lewis's character where, now, from that, like send in the clowns or, or whatever that song oh, the yeah. movie was. But he, Hitler the clown is a clown that's dressed like Hitler and he's got like a green little mustache. <laughs> He's got this weird wavy hair that's green. Uh -huh. He's got his face all made up. It, his swastika, it, you know, spits out, um, spits out uh, evil mist. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And it's do 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 do, and it's you know hop steps and stuff like that. And in true WWE fashion, you know, so it's not offensive. It's H I T T L E R. Mm -hmm. You know, so you gotta go two T's so that we know that he's not related to Adolf Hitler. And I said, man, this could, what a, what a battle him and Cabana, who Cabana is so, uh, uh, he's so offended that the wrestling company would allow somebody that's trying to put this stereotype into today's world that he fights it. But imagine he fights it and gets it away. And then eventually two heels are beating down Cabana and here comes Hitler, the clown to make the save. And the next day on ROHwrestling.com, it would say Hitler saves the Jews. <laughs> right and that always gets the okay so what do you got next but yeah we you know we, we don't want to use those old stereotypes because we're so worried about offending people it's entertainment we need to offend to a point because you want to get i want to get mad because at the end of the day i want to see the hero overcome this this ignorance and uh, oppression and these negative stereotypes and win out in the end and so i think booking sometimes we play it way too safe Mm -hmm. absolutely well we've we've already done more than an hour oh wow so uh 
I, but I don't want to let you off the hook from like the theme of this podcast. Okay. I, I have these conversations to get to this one point. This is the million dollar question. I've gotten people from all walks of life, comedians, pro wrestlers, politicians, uh, brewers, restaurateurs, and stuff like that to ask this one question. It's the theme of the podcast and is the idea of success. What does it mean to you? Uh, when I say the word, what pops in your head? Do you have a clear idea of it? Do you have a vision of it? Do you feel like you've achieved it? Do you feel like you seek it every day? Does it have a dollar amount attached to it? Um, is it something that you feel like you'll ever achieve? And if you do, will you be happy when you do? So basically what I say is when I say the word success, what pops in your brain? Wow, that's a weird question to ask me because uh, when we're done, I'm about to go to the airport and do something I never thought I was about to do. So, uh, And it's been playing in my mind of what is going to make Steve Carino successful? Or was I always, uh, you know, and I woke up this morning and I said, man, like I am so happy of where I'm at and what I've done. I never made millions of dollars in wrestling, but I made okay, like, and what is okay? Like I have a, I have a nice house. I have a, like, um, you know, I have two great kids. I have a, a, you know, I married the, you know, I, after two bad marriages, I married the high school cheerleader, you know, like, um, the, like the woman of my dreams. I have everything that I've ever wanted when it comes to wrestling. Like, man, I was a skinny kid that grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia and just dreamed about being a professional wrestler. The fact that like, I actually did it one time I was already success in my mind, you know? So if you ask me that now in, in 23 years, like maybe if you wrote it down on paper, I'm, I'm never going to be a WWE hall of famer. I never wrestled at WrestleMania. I never, uh, you know, I never probably drew the money or been the top star in today's wrestling. But you know, for me, yeah, I, I believe that total success, total success because of, I never thought I would do one one millionth of what I've done in the last 23 years and the things that I've seen and the things that I've experienced and the, the people that I've met and the, the heroes that went from me reading about them in Bill After's magazine to being their friend. And, um, you know, so success I, success, I think, is measured by what you believe is success. And, and, and for me, it's not a dollar amount or... Um, my name being called for the Hall of Fame or even having World Wrestling Entertainment on my check. Um, it's knowing that, man, like I still love what I do. I still love that I got the opportunity to do it. And at the end of the day, man, if it ends today, if I like, I can't wrestle ever again, I feel like, wow, I've lived this crazy life of dreams that I never thought as an eight-year-old kid watching Tommy Wildfire Rich and Gordon Sully in my parents' bedroom for the first time that I would ever, ever get to live. So for, for me, that that is unbelievable success. Uh, it's like winning $400 million in the, in the lottery. And, you know, I, I, could never, I could never put a dollar amount to it. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, uh, is there anything you want to let people know coming up? Uh, you have a live microphone to let people know, hey, come check this out. Follow me on Twitter or whatever. So, no, no, uh, I hate plugs. No, uh, <laughs> uh, on Twitter, I'm at King Carino. And uh, Facebook, I have a Facebook fan page at uh, King Carino. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, keep watching the Sullivan thing. It's, 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 it's going to take a cool right-hand turn. Okay. Right hand or a left hand? Or, you know. Well, it... it it, yeah, it's got some twists and turns. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, anyways, uh, Steve, thank you very much for sitting on. Oh, talking thank you. I've, I've, I've really, I really wanted to sit down and have this conversation with you, and I'm glad we got to you know spend some time together. And talk. Yeah, me too. Like, I and, and like, it. I'm so busy these days. That I don't get down and sit down and talk like this with you. Like, we talked for like ten minutes. Yeah, and it was great. And then we we, we, we do our separate ways. And yeah. That's one of the things that I like about this podcast is like, and it's true that I say and I say it publicly. Uh, a wrestling show is always better when Jake Manning and Zane Riley are in the locker room. Well, I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. <laughs>